thing. There are times when we should get away from things. There are times when we should run just as fast as we can run. But it shouldn't be because we decide to. It should be because God tells us to. And what we do is we run away from places where God wants us to stay, and we stay places where He wants us to get out of. Can anybody say amen? amen. Well, bless God, I ain't putting up with this man I'm married to anymore. I'm out of here. And then on the other hand, you'll have some woman who's been letting some guy beat her up and abuse her and abuse her kids for 25 years, and she won't go anywhere. God didn't call you to be beat up and abused and to stand around and let your kids be beat up and abused. That's not what God has for you. And you got to stand up and you got to confront that stuff and say, I'm not going to live like this. I'm not going to be treated like this. I'm not going to let my kids be treated like this. Don't let anybody make you think you're worthless because they mistreat you. Don't judge your worth and value by how somebody else treats you. Judge your worth and value by what God has to say about you in His Word. But I'm sure glad that Dave didn't run away from our marriage in the early days. And believe me, I would have been somebody you would have wanted to have gotten away from. <laughs> it was not pretty. But he knew God wanted him to stay. And there are times when God wants to use you in somebody else's life. And it may not be all pretty, and it may not be all comfortable, but they need somebody to show them Jesus. Yeah. Come on now. They need somebody to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which He will work for you if you'll just hang in there. Don't ever go anywhere until God tells you to. Don't leave a church unless God tells you to. Don't leave a job unless God tells you to. And when God says go, then you go. We all know that God told Abraham, it's recorded in Genesis 12, leave your father and your mother and your family and your home and everything that you know to this point and go to the place that I will show you. I mean, my gosh, God didn't even tell him where he was going. <laughs> Wouldn't even give him a hint. He just said, go. Why did God tell Abraham that he had to do that? It was more than just to see if Abraham would obey him. His family were all idol worshipers. <laughs> and God had a plan for his life and he had to get him away from those people because of the influence that they had on him. And let me tell you something, more Christians ruin their walk with God and weaken it and water it down because they hang on to people in their life. They have friends that they spend way too much time with that are not godly, that do nothing but discourage them and suck every ounce of faith out of you that you could ever hope to have. And I'm telling you, if God is telling you that you need to part company with some friend that you've got, even if it's a relative in your family, if it's somebody that's holding you back, and you know that they are a terrible influence on you, sometimes you've got to spend some time with people just to be civil, but you don't have to just make up reasons to be around them all the time. Does anybody understand what I'm saying? I had to get away from all the naysayers when God called me because nobody believed me. My husband believed me and I had one friend that I can remember that believed me. I had people laughing at me. People thought I was crazy. We got asked to leave our church. We lost our friends. We didn't get invited to the parties anymore. And I was just trying to do what I thought God was telling me to do. I didn't understand. I thought, I mean, it was such a confusing time. For me but it was one of the best things that ever happened to me because I'll tell you one thing when you don't have anybody else you get to know God really good now Sarai Genesis 16 1 now Sarai Abram's wife had borne him no children and you know, God had promised them a child of their own. So they had a promise from God. But God hadn't come through yet, and they were tired of waiting. And she had an Egyptian maid whose name was Hagar. 
And Sarah said to Abram, see here, she got a bright idea. <laughs> Did you ever get one of those? It's like you're tired of waiting on God and you think, I know what God wants me to do. Sarah said to Abram, see here, the Lord has restrained, restrained me from bearing children. So I'm asking you to have intercourse with my maid. Now, how many of you know already, before you go any further, that's really dumb? <laughs> I mean, you just really couldn't have a very big brain and do that. But it's amazing what people will do. It's amazing the stupid things that people will do when they want something so bad. Do you know that anything can become a lust? Lust does not just involve sexual sin. You can lust after the ministry. You can lust after being a worship leader. You can lust after a house or a car or a position or to be in a certain social group. You know how you can tell when you have lust in your life? When you want something so bad that you can no longer be happy without it. Hmm. So I, I want you to take my handmaiden and have intercourse with her, and it may be that I can obtain children by her. The next dumb thing that happened, and Abram listened to and heeded what Sarai said. And it's possible that what he did was even dumber than what she did. Come on, men, stand up to us when you need to. You heard me, I said, stand up to us when you need to. Do it in a loving, respectful way. But women are a little more emotional, and you guys are supposed to be the wise ones with all the logic. So Sarah, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her Egyptian maid, I'm in verse three of Genesis 16, after Abram had dwelt 10 years in the land of Canaan, and he gave her, and she gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his secondary wife. And he had intercourse with Hagar, and she became pregnant. And when she saw that she was with child, she looked with contempt upon her mistress and despised her. Now, I wrote out here, attitude. Right away, she gets an attitude. Nah, 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 nah. I'm pregnant, and you can't get pregnant. Nah, 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 nah. Guess who Abram's going to love? Then Sarah, I, this story just amazes me. Then Sarah, <laughs> now she don't like the situation that she created. <laughs> so now she goes to Abram and says, may the responsibility for my wrong and deprivation of rights be upon you. May the responsibility for my wrong and the deprivation of my rights be upon you. I gave my maid into your bosom, and when you saw, when she saw that she was with child, I became contemptible and despised in her eyes. May the Lord be the judge between you and me. Well, Abram threw it right back at her. He said, and Abram said to Sarah, see here, your maid is in your hands in power. You do with her whatever you please. He, didn't, he washed his hands of it. He didn't want nothing to do with it either. <laughs> and when Sarah dealt severely with her, humbling and afflicting her, Hagar fled from her. Everybody say, she ran. She ran. <laughs> but the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water. Where? Where do people always end up when they run? I'm going to show you a whole bunch more of them. I was amazed when I saw this. Every time somebody runs away from a situation, they end up in the wilderness. Now, if you want to stay in the wilderness all your life, just keep running from stuff. But if you want to get out of that wilderness, live in the promised land, then you got to start confronting issues. But the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness on the road to Shur, and he said to Hagar, Sarai's maid, where did you come from and where are you intending to go? <laughs> and you know, sometimes that's when we're running, we don't know what we're doing, we're just... And she said, I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai. 
And the angel of the Lord said to her, go back to your mistress and humbly submit to her control. Ouch, 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 ouch. Oh my gosh. I have been in places where I did not feel like I was being treated right. Matter of fact, I wasn't being treated right. Places where I wasn't paid enough, places where I wasn't being respected, places where I wasn't being appreciated, and I wanted to get away from there more than I even know how to tell you that I wanted to get away from there. I wanted to go and start my own ministry. I wanted to go and do this. I wanted to go and do that. And God said, don't you run. You stay here, and you learn how to submit to authority. Can I tell you a secret? You're not fit to be in authority until you know how to come under authority. When God tells you you got a bad attitude and you blame it on somebody else and won't work with God to fix it, you're running from what God's trying to say to you and you're going to put your life in park and you're not going to go anywhere because you can run around in the wilderness for another five years, but sooner or later God's going to find you out there and say, what are you doing? You tired of this yet? Let's go back to the place you ran from. Oh my gosh, we're good tonight. I got the right crowd. Nobody's left the building yet. <laughs> Go back to your mistress and humbly submit to her control. God, did you not see how she treated me? <laughs> And now you're going to tell me, go back there and put up with that? Don't ever run away from something unless God tells you to go. I said, don't ever run away from something unless God tells you to go. Amen? 1 Kings chapter 19. How many of you are getting the message? You know, this, what it, this is what it means to die to self. This is what it means to be crucified with Christ. This is what the old saints were talking about when they talked about picking up your cross and carrying your cross. We don't teach enough about the crucifixion of the flesh. I teach on it quite a bit, but there are no padded crosses. If you're looking for a padded cross, you're not going to find one. And I want you to remember what I said, Friday always comes before Sunday. Everybody wants that resurrection life, but you're not going to have it unless you allow God to do a work of brokenness in you. Why did God send Hagar back? Because he wanted to break the self-will in her that caused her to run away from something without getting permission from God to go. Amen? Amen. 1 Kings 19, great prophet of God, Elijah, greatest prophet probably that ever lived. The day before, in chapter 18, he had slain and killed and cut up in pieces 450 prophets of Baal. Now that's a hard day's work. <laughs> and he had made an absolute fool out of them before he did that. Called down fire from heaven and just showed them who God really was. The next day, the next day. Now he's tired. We act weird when we're tired. You got to get good rest. That's part of being spiritual. It really is. It's amazing how carnal I can get if I'm really, really, really tired. First thing I want to do is start eating dessert.
I'm in the middle of about eight messages here. I got to behave. <laughs> Chapter 19, verse 1. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had slain all the prophets of Baal with the sword. And Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So let the gods do to me and more also if I don't make your life as the life of one of those by this time tomorrow. And he was afraid and he arose and he went for his life. That means he ran. And he came to Beersheba of Judah, over 80 miles out of Jezebel's realm. And he left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the what? <laughs> Isn't this just gorgeous? Don't you love the Word of God? Every time they ran, they ended up in the same place. So he came to the wilderness and he lay down under a lone broom or a juniper tree and he asked that he might die. Oh Lord, just take away my life. If this is the way you're going to treat me, God, I just want to die. Right out here. Verse 9, then there came... Then he came to a cave and he lodged in it and behold the word of the Lord came to him saying what are you doing here? <laughs> Verse 13 When Elijah heard the voice he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave and behold there came a voice to him and said what are you doing here? <laughs> Verse 15 And the Lord said to him Go and return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus and when you get there, anoint Hazael to be king over Syria, and anoint Jehu the son of Nimshi to be king over Israel, and anoint Elijah to be a prophet in your place. Well, I bet that would set you straight. <laughs> God said, you get yourself back in there and do the work of a prophet. Anoint me a new king. Anoint a prophet to take your place when I'm done with you. Start training him. What are you doing here? God dealt with me for a year to leave the church that I worked at and go out into my own ministry. And I knew when I did it that I was going to take some judgment, some criticism, and there's going to be some misunderstanding. And I didn't want to be thought of as some rebellious woman that wanted to just go out and do my own thing. But God had told me every which way that he could tell me. I mean, in astounding ways, with many confirmations, that I needed to take the ministry and go north, south, east, and west. And I kept just staying there, staying there, staying there. One night I was sitting in church and I was, I think my seat was about where this pretty lady's sitting right down here. And I mean, God hollered at me. The service was starting and God hollered at me in my spirit. He said, what are you doing here? In my heart, I said, well, Lord, it's Tuesday night. I'm going to church. <laughs> That's what I do on Tuesday nights. And you know what he said to me? I don't need you here sitting there anymore staring at that man on the platform. I need you to get out there and do what I have called you to do. <laughs> now, I still have a good relationship. But that pastor, love him very much, appreciate him and his wife and the opportunity that they gave me. But I had a call on my life that was unique, and God was giving me an opportunity to go all over the world and preach the gospel, and I kept just staying there in a place that really, as far as God was concerned, had become a wilderness for me. It wasn't a wilderness, it was a great church, but for me, it wasn't where God wanted me anymore. There was a time when I wanted to leave and God wouldn't let me. And then there came the time when he told me to leave and I didn't want to go. Is anybody home out there? Why won't God just let us do what we want to do when we want to do it? God, why can't I just go if I want to go and stay if I want to stay? Oh, no. God's got to always get in our business and make us do things His way. <laughs> but it always works out better in the end, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, we don't have time to go to the book of Jonah, but let me just say that... Well, yeah, let's, let's put it up. <laughs> 
Jonah chapter 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim against it, for their wickedness has come before me. But Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish from being in the presence of the Lord. Now, if you look at a map, Tarshish is the exact opposite direction from Nineveh. God said, go to Nineveh, and he said, I'm out of here. I don't want to preach to those people, don't like those people, don't even think they deserve the gospel, I'm out of here. So he gets on a ship, and he's going to get as far away as he can get. They get out in the ocean, and a horrible storm comes up. And I mean, they're throwing stuff overboard, and everybody's afraid they're going to die. And pretty soon, these guys say, there's somebody on this ship that's got sin in their life. <laughs> Who is it? <laughs> and so they cast lots, which was equivalent to rolling dice, and the lot fell on Jonah. And they said, it's you. You're going overboard. <laughs> they threw him overboard, and immediately, the storm calmed down. Now, that's a whole other teaching. I best not go there, but let me just say that at every stop, somebody usually has to get off the bus. <laughs> Maybe I'll just let you figure the rest of that out for yourself. We want to drag people with us that aren't even walking with God, and God's trying to deal with them, and they got a huge mess in their life, and it's overflowing on us, and we can't figure out what's wrong. Well, get around some people that are blessed. Get around some people that are obedient. Get around some people that have got the presence and the favor of God on their life. It'll get off on you, too. Amen? Look at verse 17. Jonah's out there in the ocean. The ship's gone. Now the Lord had prepared and appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. <laughs> and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. I cannot even imagine what that was like. So finally Jonah gets around to repenting. Verse 10, chapter 2, the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. Can you imagine what he looked like? Come on, let's get a picture of this. He's got vomit all over him and seaweed hanging all over him. Woo! Now look, here's Jonah. Or I don't know, maybe he was down here, we'll just. Now watch this. I think I can end my message with this and you'll get it. <laughs> Chapter 3, verse 1. And the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh. <laughs> <laughs> God didn't change his mind. And he's not going to change his mind about what he's told you to do either. So you can go to the wilderness for 40 years or 10 days or two weeks or six months. You can go out in the wilderness and sit under a lone broom tree and tell God how you want to die. You can go get on a ship somewhere, get thrown off, get eaten by a fish. And God's still going to say, go back where you ran from and do what I told you to do. Come on, somebody give God praise. No more running. We are the anointed of the Lord. Well, I want to remind you that you do not have to be afraid of anything. Now, you may feel fear, but you don't have to be afraid. They're two different things. We can be bold, courageous, and we can handle anything that comes our way because God has promised that he will never put more on us than what we can bear.